Bob Bjork, Director of the Arizona Center for Medieval Renaissance Studies. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to another lecture in our Scholar Series. Um, this is a lecture in, in, in Brown Bag Lunch. I've never seen a brown bag at it yet. Um, but um, there's been a lecture every time. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Carrie Porter Bryce, the Chief Exhibits Curator of ASU Libraries. Um, she's had close to 25 years experience in cultural resource management in museums and anthropology, um, serving in virtually all operations capacities from docent to director in several institutions in the Midwest and Southwest. Her curatorial work and field work focuses on the cultures of the ancient Americas, and besides being chief exhibits curator here at ASU. She's also been co-chair of the Library Exhibits Committee, past co-chair of the Museum Galleries Collections Committee, and is also currently a surveyor and peer reviewer for the Museum Assessment Program of the American Alliance of Museums. It's really amazing that we could get a person of this caliber, caliber at ASU and um, I'm delighted that she's agreed to share her expertise with us today. She's not going to make it too much expertise because most of us are probably um, fairly novice in, in this area. But those of you who have more in-depth knowledge can pursue that in the question and answer period after her talk. She's been at ASU since 2006, and this is the first time she's spoken at ACMRS. So thank you very much. And she'll be talking to you about medieval women. <laughs> thank you very much, Bob. Uh, thank you for coming today. I know that coming to ASU can be challenging for some folks. Uh, the parking is always an adventure. <laughs> A little bit about me. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest in the on the Illinois-Wisconsin state line. And my first trip to Mesoamerica was in the back of a station wagon. My father came home one day in the middle of December and said, we're going to Mexico. And he piled us all up in the car, and we drove from northernmost Illinois to Waco, Texas that first day. And the second day, we were in central Mexico. Yeah, yeah. I was in fifth grade. And it was that on that trip that I first climbed the Temple of the Sun at Teotihuacan and then saw a lot of the ruins that were at least available in the early 70s in Mexico City. We ended up in Acapulco and then drove deadhead back after about three, four weeks. But yeah, that was my, my immersion, my initial immersion into Mexico and the ancient cultures. From then, I uh, went back at least a couple times as a teenager, and then throughout my adult life. I did my field work at the site of Copan in Honduras with Bill Fash, and uh, uh, folks that also contributed to my scholarship were Dr. Jeff Kowalski in the Art History Department of Northern Illinois University, and Virginia Miller at the University of Illinois Chicago. Uh, I was a member of the Chicago Maya Society, we were an ad hoc group that all met at the Texas meetings in about 1991. At one point in the meetings, we, uh, we decided perhaps there were kindred spirits in the crowd, and uh, they announced from the podium if there were any members from Chicago who wanted to put together a Maya Society group to meet and, and after the meeting, and uh, the entire auditorium erupted into laughter as though, you know, what good came out of Chicago? But we were active for about 18 <coughs> years and actually produced a couple of publications. So, uh, <clears throat> to start, this is uh, my talk on medieval Maya queens. Uh, the medieval period here at the ACM, at ACMRS goes from 400 to 1700 AD. Now, uh, the Maya post-classic goes from about 1200 to 1500, but we're going to be focusing primarily on the Maya classic period. And uh, in central, central southern Mexico, 
uh, the Mexico-Guatemala border, uh, some parts of Honduras. So, uh, so here is the map of the Maya region. I'm sure there's a lot of you here who are familiar with that. Uh, some of the places we'll be uh, talking about are trying to find the is the laser pointer in, in the the black button in the middle. Black button in the middle. Okay, so here's T. Call. A lot of you are familiar with that. Uh, a lot of folks are familiar with the Maya region from uh, the big sites in the Yucatan Peninsula. But we're going to be focusing on a lot of sites that are down here along the Usuma Sinta River and out to the southeast periphery at Copan. So these, oh, this one. these are representations of Maya women in ceramics and painted ceramics. And just to give you an idea, idea of what we're looking at, sometimes these are hard to see if you're not sure what you're looking at. So a three-dimensional representation might help you to see what we're looking at with these stela, which are most of the art that we'll be looking at, Maya stela. Uh, they range in size from about five feet to 10 feet tall. They're carved mostly on the front surface, but they also have engraving on the back and the sides. They usually represent a person of noble lineage, and it, primarily gives you the date and the activities that were performed regarding placing of the monument and then uh, the location and uh, sometimes some of the titles and information about the individual performing the event. So on the left you see a line drawing of a lintel from Yash Chiwan and on the right side you see a painting that I did of it. Just to give you an idea, if you're looking at the line drawing, you might think you're looking at a plate of spaghetti because all of these lines are very um, tight and confusing. But on the right, you can see if once you add the color and the volume to the figures, you can kind of get an idea of you know where the person starts and the clothing or the glyph text ends. So this is just a simple line drawing of a lot of the Maya sites found in uh, Mesoamerica. Uh, just to highlight, here's Tikal in the middle, Palenque out here in the west, Copan out on the southeast. So it's not quite an identical map, but what this diagram shows you are the kinds of relationships that these sites share. And when we're talking about Maya women, we're sometimes thinking of people who maybe they're from Palenque, maybe they're from Tikal or some of these other sites, but you can see how complex the relationships and the conflicts are in the Maya during the classic period. Okay, the, there are statements in hieroglyphic texts of specific relationships, diplomatic contacts that are mentioned in some of the glyph texts, uh, family ties, these dotted lines, which is something that will look more specifically at, and conflicts, those are, you know, skirmishes, wars, um, like prisoner exchanges. So, uh, if you can see here, here's Palenque, which was famous for having noble women going out into other communities to marry into other lineages. So here's Palenque, and you can see all the dotted lines going here, going here, out here, all the way down to Copan. So we're talking about a level of elite interrelationships that might be comparable to Queen Victoria. You know, when you think of Queen Victoria and all her children, uh, how they went out and intermarried into so many of the royal families in Europe. In similar fashion, we've got uh, that kind of activity going on in the Maya region. Now, when we talk about uh, the, uh, we're using the term queen which is a concept that we can understand in Western culture, but to the Maya, the, <coughs> if this woman may be a ruler in her own right, she may be married to the male ruler of the polity, she may be a sister or somehow otherwise related, so there is a lot of nuance and complexity in how we talk about elite Maya women in the classic period.
So we're going to start at about 400. <clears throat> And uh, this is the site of Copan. And if, whenever possible, I'm going to try to use the, uh, the name of the town as we can glean from Maya epigraphy. So Copan is down in Honduras. And from the best we can determine by the glyphs in the emblem symbol, it's referred to as Oshwitik in Maya. The earliest record we have of an actual Maya dynasty is about 400 with the arrival of Yash Kukmo in Copan. He built a series of temples that were under this part of the, um, the Acropolis in the city of Copan. And his queen at that time was a woman, an elite woman of the local Honduran lineage. We believe Yash Kukmo either came from Tikal or Kaminao Kuyu, and he was using a lot of symbolism from the city-state of Teotihuacan in the north, in, way to the north in the Mexican Central Valley. So his wife, although we don't have any representation of her, we do have her tomb down here in the Margarita phase of Rosalila. If any of you have any of you been to Copan and seen the Rosalila reconstruction in the, in the museum, it's quite breathtaking. This structure here has been rebuilt and reimagined in the uh, the site museum, but it is its actual structure is buried under many many layers of later construction. The Maya tended to do this with their buildings. They might have started off with a very small, modest building, and over time, as more members of lineages were born and made their mark on the city, they would build over the top of these buildings like layers of onions. And so you've got the first layer here, which would have been um, what Yash Kukmo himself would have built, and his wife's tomb in the margarita phase of it. She was actually buried in, a, in what they call an oven. You know, they, they called the tomb an oven for reasons we'll probably get into a little later. So that was at 400 to about 450 AD. And that's way out on the southwest periphery of the Maya. Okay, here we are at uh, Tikal, which you may be very familiar with. It's seen a lot of pictures of Those of you who are Star Wars fans know that this is the Yavin rebel base. So, but yeah, if, when you watch that first. Uh, so we're looking here now at a uh, little bit later than the Queen of Copan. Uh, this is Lady of Tikal, or Yash Mutal, as we can determine from the glyphs. And we really don't even know her name. We only have these glyphs which tell us uh, her, her gender and position. And she reigned on her own at this time for a few years. Let's see. Um, I believe it was at least 20. Yeah. She was uh, born in 504 and died in 527. And she actually took the throne at the age of six. So she probably ruled with a co-regent and his name, as far as we can determine from the text, was Kolom Te Bafam. Bafam is uh, the word for jaguar in Maya languages. So a lot of ruling people take on that name as a, as a title or as an actual name of the person. This is her monument. This is So you can see just how difficult it is sometimes to glean these these uh, titles and relationships and names because um, these are hieroglyphics here and they're some eroded here and so what we can get out of these texts um, probably her name would have been down here in this bottom eroded part and this was uh, glyphs that told us the date of when these events happened and who was interacting and probably right about to hear was like woman of Copan and then we were woman of Tikal and then that would have been perhaps her name and that's gone. If you take pictures of the eroded part with the camera, 
can you get a visualization of it? Uh, we have to use a raking light. So, for example, if I were to stand almost sideways okay. like this and shoot a light at, at either in the dark or at dusk, that raises the um, the relief a bit, so you can see what they look like. You'll probably see something like that in one of the later photographs. So here we are, oh, just a little later, with the women of Palenque. And Palenque happened to have a really strong reputation at this point of uh, women recognized as queens in their own right. We have at least three strong queens that we can talk about from Palenque, or Bac, Bacal, or La Camha. Uh, there are a lot of different names that can be read in the hieroglyphic texts about these ancient cities because we believe that over time cities started off small, of course, and then grew. Uh, Bach is actually the word for bone or heron in Maya language, and La uh, Kamha is the place of big water. So as the city grew, uh, probably a small part of it was referred to one way, and then different parts of the city were referred to in others. We do know that the city of Palenque sits on a river system that has some beautiful cascades that went through the royal structures and parts of the, um, the high end of the village. So these beautiful, beautiful waterfalls were a part of that, um, that uh, the, the city. So these three queens, Ish Yol Ignal, Ish, you'll see that, that uh, syllable quite frequently. That is the word for lady or queen or woman. So Ish Yol Ignal, Ish Sak Kuk, and Ish Zap Bu Ahal. So these names are easy to say sometimes for, uh, for <laughs> non Maya speakers. Um, the first of the dynasty was, oops, sorry. Ish Yoki. Now, this is a picture of her that was taken from the side of the Kal sarcophagus. That's one of the most famous images from Palenque, is that big tomb down in the bottom of the Temple of the Inscriptions. And Pakal was the, one of the greatest kings at Palenque. This is his ancestor. And uh, she was one of the first women at Palenque to rule in her own right as queen. It wasn't like she um, was helping a younger child to you know, grow into their, she wasn't a regent, so to speak. She was more a queen in her own right. Ish Sakuk, who came about 50 years later from, from Yod, Ish Yokitnao was 583. Here we go in 615, where we have a monument that showed Ish Sakuk making a dedication to her son as he was taking the crown. And Ish Sakuk Ahau was uh, the wife of her grandson. And all of these women at Tikal were, um, they provided access to resources. As you can see here in this, you can see the female profile here, but growing up out of her head is a plant. And here, coming out of Ish Sakuk, is another plant. And what we think those represent are orchards or um, fields or agricultural resources that these families probably control. This might be a calabash or uh, some kind of citrus. And this is a cacao pot. So we know that some of these uh, royal lineages actually controlled some uh, agricultural aspects of these different communities. So here we have Lady Sakpuk in the Oval Palace tablet, and the ritual she's performing here is to hand over this headdress to her son, who is Hana Pakal. Kinich uh, Hana Pakal was his full title, and it means sun-eyed uh, great shield. And he was uh, one of the most well-known kings in Maya history. 
here, he's probably about 12. Uh, she served as his regent for a while until he celebrated his first 20-year period ending. Uh, the Maya number system is based on 20. And so if you think about us celebrating centuries and decades, the Maya celebrated periods of 400 years and 20 years, and then years and days and months. So when uh, a king was in power or a queen was in power at the time at one of these period endings happened, there was usually some kind of dedication of a monument or some building project, something that commemorated the end of this period of time. If some of you might have remembered, in the year 2012, there was a lot of talk about uh, the Maya calendar coming to an end. And what that actually referred to was the end of a Bakhtu. And uh, we, of course, the world didn't end at the end of the Maya calendar. We stepped into a new period of time that will uh, last another 400 years. Here we have a picture of Kinich Hana Kakao. And these uh, picture here, these two people here are, these are images of them after they've died. And what happens in Maya culture, and uh, a faculty member here in <coughs> religious studies studies this quite intensely, is that the Maya believe that even after you've passed, you're, you're still a person, you're still a member of the family, and there are rituals and activities that they do to reach out, <coughs> to include them in their daily lives. And so what's going on in this picture is the, <clears throat> the son of Pakal here is Kan Hoi Chitan, the person here in the middle. He's already into his adult years by quite a bit, and his parents died a long time before his accession. But it shows in this image his mother and his father bestowing upon him items that would be important to him as a ruler. And so what he's doing is establishing a connection to the lineage and including his mother and father in the activities, although they, are, they passed on. Now that's not to say that the Maya didn't recognize or don't recognize the nature of death in their culture. It's just not a, an obstacle to them to maintaining relationships with family and ancestors and important people in their lives. The women of Yashchilan, or Pachan, uh, Yashchilan was a big player in uh, Maya studies. Uh, there were several royal women of note at Yashchilan over many years. I'll focus on mostly the queens of the 7th and 8th centuries. Uh, one who comes up quite frequently is Ish Kabal Shok. She was the principal wife of Itzamna Malam III. Um, Shok is a, I think we believe it is a shark. And uh, if we can see some of her accessories in her regalia, you might see that. Now, I understand that looking at these line drawings might be you know, like looking at a plate of spaghetti, but I can kind of highlight some of the features that will tell you a little bit about what's going on. This is Lady Shulk, or Lady Shark, and she has performed this kind of a ceremony. Uh, what's happening here is that she is letting blood, she is pulling a rope of thorns through her tongue and dripping that blood onto the paper underneath. This is a, a bark paper that the Maya produced. La Candon in southern Mexico produces paper still. And so as she pulls the, now I don't think it was as big as it's shown. I mean, I, I'm sure that would tear your tongue apart, but uh, it was probably a finer cord with smaller thorns. But they want you to get the idea of this is the kind of activity that, oops, that she's performing. Sorry. So in this activity, what she's doing is uh, making what we call an auto-sacrifice to attract the attention of her ancestors. And what you see here is that this is after this, 
the auto sacrifice. She's probably fasted, danced, uh, taken perhaps some hallucinogenic uh, plants or mushrooms, and had a lot of blood loss. So she's in a trance-like state. And she is communicating here with somebody from either the past or a ritual aspect of her husband, the king. It, his face here is coming out of the body of something that looks like a snake or a combination of a snake and a centipede. And it is that connection, it's almost like an umbilical cord that connects the Maya ancestors to the present in this picture. So she is the, probably the person who has the strongest relationship with the ancestors she's trying to reach. And, and when we see these pictures in Maya art, ancient Maya art, what we're looking at is probably, it's not a general, I'm going to conjure up a god. I think it's more specific in that Lady Shulk had a relationship with an ancestor or a person in the past or present, and she was the one with the most connection to this person that made it possible for her to connect and bring that person through the umbilicus between the living and the dead and have that relationship, that connection, that influence. Who is that connected to? Uh, let's see. Okay, so here's the mouth of the snake here, the body going down and through. It's connected to right down here. Yeah, it's connected to the underworld as far as you know where the, the person being contacted. But how she did it, you can see here this bowl. This is a bowl, and it has strips of bark paper with blood spots on it. So uh, what they did was after they. They let the blood, they put it on the paper, they burned that paper, and as the smoke rose and enveloped them, they believed that brought the connection to the ancestors. So as you can see here, we have a woman of Dos Pilas, or Motul, and Naranjo. These are sites that are pretty close together in the southern lowlands. And this is Lady, or Ishwak, Chanel Ahau, or Lady Wak. Uh, I think it's Lady Six Stone, or it's something we, we gloss that as. And here she is here in her jade vet skirt, and she is holding in her arms the bowl that has the equipment she would be using to perform a very similar sacrifice to what Lady Shok was doing at Yashchilan. So she's demonstrating that she has the capability and the material to uh, perform these sacrifices. She was actually known as a ruler in her own right without even having somebody there as, you know, she, did not, she didn't have a descendant but for which she had to serve as regent. She showed up in Naranjo from Dos Pilas as the daughter of a king and married into the lineage and produced the heir, smoking squirrel, who, you know, when we look at these glyphs, you're not quite sure how to pronounce them in their original language, so a lot of kings in the Maya, ancient Maya culture would have these glossed names that don't make a lot of sense to us. So here she is, you can see here at her belt, this is the Shulk monster. It looks like <coughs> it has an open mouth, it's got long, sharp teeth, there's a shell in it right there. And in her arms, she holds a flint knife, uh, a shell, and some paper. It's difficult to see in there. I know sometimes these, um, you have to really look at these things for a long time to get a sense of what they're, they're representing. But you can see here in the glyph text, if you can discern it right there, this is a woman's profile. Lady, there's the lady right there, six sky. She is a lord or a sacred person of Motul and a Calonte in her own right. So she was of a really high standing. She, I believe, was in a higher rank than her own husband at the site of Naranjo. In this monument here, she is celebrating the first cartoon 
of her son. So that's about, um, it could be within the next 20 years. So uh, it, it, these content endings um, happen on the 20 year mark, but uh, they tie their dates through a series of numbers and months that we call distance numbers. So a monument might be built and they'll give you the date that the monument was, was established. It could have been on a birthday, a wedding, uh, a death. And then they will tie that date from the day of that event to a period ending. And so a lot of these monuments will have very complex mathematical calculations on them that anchor that into time for the Maya. So you can see on uh, Stila 24, these long complex glyph texts. And this is a pretty nice one because it's very clearly carved. There's not a lot of erosion. And you can, if you've had a few classes in my glyphs, you can read them. The other monument, Monument 3, of course, looks really eroded. So it's very difficult to tell what exactly happened. We can guess by the date and some of the information down here that it fell at a time when they were celebrating the cartoon ending. Yeah, on the previous slide, the figure underneath uh, that she's standing on. Right here, this guy. What, what do we know about that? Um, that is a, probably a prisoner that was taken in a battle over which she supervised as ruler of uh, polity or, or these towns. Uh, you were considered the victor of a skirmish, a battle, in, in which uh, people were taken captive and brought back to your city. So this guy down here, and he's got a little symbol right there, which should tell you where he's from. Uh, he was taken prisoner in one of these uh, battles and brought back to Naranjo. It was, uh, a number of different things happened to people who were taken captive. Sometimes they're brought back and dispatched right away as far as sacrifice. Uh, sometimes they're kept at the site over a period of years and just bled out slowly as of contributing to ritual activity. And sometimes they even get to return to their cities of origin. So when it shows here that she's standing on a person, this is somebody over whom she has some power now. So, and this here, I believe, is uh, that's an earth monster face. So Lady Ishkabel, uh, formerly known as uh, Lady Kabi of El Peru, was also another one of these uh, very high-ranking, very powerful women during the Maya period. These, these, uh, when we first started looking at the Maya culture, you know, 100, 150 years ago, and uh, typically uh, expeditions of men would go out into the jungle and find these ruins and look at these monuments, of course, they, they really weren't entirely sure what they were looking at. So they assumed these were all men. They assumed that these were all um, peaceful, timekeeping scientists. And all of that changed very drastically in 1946 when murals were discovered at the site of Bonaparte that actually showed um, a battle where you know, the people were being taken prisoner and they're uh, being uh, tortured and sacrificed in some of these sites. And uh, so it really did set the Maya research community on its ear. Uh, Sir Eric Thompson, who was very instrumental in introducing the Maya to a broader popular interest, was the, determined that, no, the Maya were peaceful, timekeeping priests. Uh, you wouldn't see women displayed in any of these images. Uh, there was a lot of resistance to accepting who the Maya really were and that there was a lot of activity going on between both genders up until the early 1970s and as Sir Eric uh, began to uh, be less and less involved in Maya studies, the younger generations of Mayanists started really looking at these uh, inscriptions and monuments and art and saying, well, you know, we really think there's a lot more going on here than just men looking at the stars. We think that there's actual human lifespans being displayed and, and described and that actual historic events were occurring. So if you notice here, when, when we're talking about the change in looking at 
what we're seeing in Maya monuments, the difference that we would see between a male and a female, for example, this is a woman, and we know that because of what she's wearing. She's wearing a long textile gown with very elaborate jewelry, and in her name blocks, you can actually see, here's the, the profile of the female. And so here, you, again, we have somebody who's obviously female that, unless you knew what you were looking at, you might have uh, thought, well, that's, that's a Maya king. Well, that's actually a Maya queen. And she is telling you who she is by what she wears on her head. I have a friend who did her dissertation just looking at people's headdresses and determining that the monster or the animal or the symbol in your headdress actually ties you to a family lineage. She's telling you what she's doing because of what she's wearing at her belt. She's going to be performing an auto-sacrifice. This is, again, a shark monster, a shark with a shell in his mouth. And in this text here, here we have the female profile twice. This is who she is, and this is a title that she earned as a leader, and it's Kalonte, which means the splitter of trees, uh, opener of trees. And in a lot of these texts, what we know is that Maya lineages were described as houses or trees with branches. There are actually images of young lords wearing jewelry that have a symbol called the Zuk symbol, and it means branch. So what we're looking at are different branches of these Maya lineages. This is an interesting monument. It's in Tikal. It's uh, Altar 5, and it gets a lot of attention because what we're looking at. You see there are two lords. There's one guy from Tikal, one guy from Kalakmu, who at the time were in conflict. And it, the person between them is his wife, but she's from his community. At the time of her death, she wasn't in Tikal, she was in Kalakmul, and she had died, and eight years later, her husband wanted to retrieve her. Now, this is a part of Maya culture that continues today. After a person has died, they're buried in a tomb called a peep, or an oven, and over a period of three to five to ten years, as their flesh decays off the bones, then the descendants or the people connected to that person go into the tomb, clean off the bones, and make bundles out of them, and take them back to their homes. And that person, who is bundled here, um, becomes an active member of the household again, either through, uh, they feed them, they talk to them, they pray to them, they, they interact with them in a number of different ways. Appropriately, you know, they, they're not running around scaring people with their femurs, but uh, they, it's, a, it's an activity that continues to this day. And what the text says down here is that this is her bones, the lady, and then her titles. So we never determined what the wife's name was, but Hassan Chan Kawil was a very important ruler in Tikal. And he needed her to be present, even in this state of um, past, past her living. You know, she was dead. She was represented by her, her bones. But she needed to be present at Tikal for a period ending that fell in 711 AD. So he went. They stopped fussing and fighting. They mutually dug her up and took her back to Tikal, where she was commemorated on this altar. And the accompanying stila had a, a, a cache, uh, an interred offering under the monument that included bones, who we believe to be her. So they brought her back to Tikal. They did the event, and they put her in a, a little cyst or a, a small tomb under the monument to bring her back home, so to speak. Here we have Ish Katunahau and her daughter, uh, Ish Huntan Ak. Uh, 
She was from a small town called Naman, which we don't really know a lot about, but she was of high enough standing that when uh, Lady Katuna Howe came to um, Piedras Negras, which is another town along the Usuma Santa River, uh, she was a powerful female ruler. Not, I don't know if she ever was a Calonte or you know anything involved in battle, but just that she is on a monument like this gives her status and position, and uh, we can read from the hieroglyphic inscriptions some of the things that she did. On this monument here, this is Stila One, which shows her in full frontal. Uh, and that's very unusual for the Maya region. Most of the time we see people displayed in profile. And in Piedras Negras, the um, artists there displayed their rulers in full frontal appearance. You can see the garments she's wearing are very elaborate. And she is holding a Quetzal feather fan. She's wearing a huge back rack of green feathers. So she's displaying her power and wealth in what she's wearing. And in this picture here, this is a few years later, and she's seated on a throne, and at her knee is her three-year-old daughter. So Lady Katuna Howe is here, and Lady Precious Turtle, that's how that gloss is, is seated at her knee right here at the age of three. The Piedras Negras lineage, the, the um, lineage that she married into, was known for using the turtle as their symbol. And so the daughter, being the precious turtle, is a member of that lineage there. Is that turtle in the glyph somewhere? You could probably see it. It's, it's sometimes difficult to tell because it looks like either an empty turtle shell or an old man coming out of a turtle shell. So um, it's in there somewhere. Probably here. There's an upended frog, so that's... That's the symbol for was born. So it's talking about how this child was born. And how it gets, it, as you can see, it's, it's kind of tight and, and dark. So it's on there. It might also be on the bench down here, too. <coughs> now we go back to Yashchilan, which is a big city that went through some ups and downs during its history. Uh, in the mid-8th century, there was a ruler that we call Bird Jaguar because his name, as it comes up, you can see it right there, is, is a jaguar profile there with a little bird laying on top of it. So he was Bird Jaguar IV, and his wife here is Lady Mut Balam of a community called Hishmeets. And again, we're seeing her doing the auto-sacrifice, pulling the rope of thorns through her tongue. Oops. You can just press the play button. Press the play button. Right there. Okay, so. the, the laser pointer button is really close to the play button. Okay, here we are. So, what you see here with Bird Jaguar's elaborate costume and this bowl here full of bloody paper, she's pulling the rope of thorns through her mouth, but he's performing an act of auto-sacrifice that I think you've heard of. Um, the, it wasn't always good to be the king, because what was expected of Maya rulers was that they had to perform a very special act of auto-sacrifice, pulling blood from one of their most intimate parts of their body. So um, it was uh, a very challenging way to prove your fealty and your ritual power. But here he is doing that right there. In this picture, we have another female ruler. This is one of my favorite pictures in the Corpus of Maya art. This is a phenomenal lintel. These, these uh, square rectangular pieces you see here come from Yashchilan. They are uh, up into the door jams of these buildings. And uh, you wouldn't see them unless you were walking underneath and looking up. 
and the doors are only about five so high. So if you were taller than that, you'd have to bend over. And if you can imagine, these elaborate headdresses would make their wearers seem six and seven and eight feet tall, but the, the doorways that they would have to go through are about five feet. So they would have to bend over to get into the buildings. So here we have uh, Ishwak Tomb, or Lady Six Stone, from Motul de San Jose. And this is a satellite site of Tikal, and she is either a vassal wife or a, a younger wife of the ruler Bird Jaguar. Now, Bird Jaguar, the way we read the text is that there's a series of women associated with Bird Jaguar. We, we are not sure entirely if these are all wives if they are uh, sisters, if they are uh, women whose kings and husbands have been captured and sacrificed, or uh, they've come to the community through other kinds of either diplomatic or um, assumed through conquest. So she is one of the younger wives of Bert Jaguar. And this is her first ceremony where she's done the bloodletting and brought forth an ancestor. And uh, this is the ancestor coming out of the body of the snake, which is a, kind of a metaphor for the smoke that rises from the burning of this paper. And she is seeking some kind of advice or guidance from this ancestor coming to her through the snake there. Here, um, if some of you have been to Honduras or seen the city of Copan, this is the hieroglyphic stairway. It was started in one of the earlier reigns, but was completed in its later history by uh, a gentleman here, Kak Yiyak Chai Kawil. So fire, um, sky Kawil. Kawil was one of their um, patrons or deities that they used to uh, access ritual power. So they would include these names, like Chan being Sky, Kawil, which may be a vague reference to uh, lightning. So here's the portrait of the ruler in full carved, full volumetric uh, sculpture as Stila M. And behind him rises the hieroglyphic stairway. So these steps are all carved with Maya glyphs, and it recounts the history of the Copan dynasty up till the 15th member, and uh, it was his wife, Lady Chak Nik Yeshuk, from Palenque that came to Copan at this time. Uh, Copan's early history was very peaceful and rich for very uh, quite a few years, but as the community grew and other communities around them grew, there were more and more competition and tensions and all kinds of problems that led to environmental, social, and, um, and economic almost collapse at this point. They haven't quite collapsed yet at Copan here. And what we believe they're trying to do is bring in a powerful wife from the city of Palenque to shore up the dynasty as they go into the last they, they didn't realize it at the time, but this is the second to the last king in this dynasty. And they brought in a woman from Palenque, whose history includes a lot of very strong women, well connected to um, strong supernatural activity. So they believe bringing a woman from that community with that kind of influence and power will reinvigorate the family here at Kohan. Could I ask a question? Sure. So did you read that in glyphs, or did you find evidence of some kind of violence to the bones or burning temples? Or how do you know there was a lot of violence? Well, the 13th ruler, we're looking at the 15th ruler here. The 13th ruler's name was Washaklahun Mbakawil, basically 13 rabbit is what we called him for a long time. And he was pretty, Pretty positive, pretty successful, pretty popular, up until he reached his later years. And then for some reason, he and his nephew at the neighboring site got into conflict. And uh, the nephew ended up taking his uncle and decapitating him. 
So at that point, the ruling family of Copan kind of hit a very crisis moment. And it was his um, son and grandson who needed to reestablish the uh, political, economic, and environmental strength of Copan. And they very nearly did it. Uh, the, what was that in the cliffs, or did you see yeah, the evidence of the bones? Oh yeah, it, it happened, you can find it in the glyphs, not just at Copan, on the monuments, but also in the neighboring site of Kirigua, <coughs> where this nephew had been established. It's all over the monuments of Kirigua, about how cool it was that this guy went and killed the big king in the neighboring city and assumed all that power and assumed all the... Did they cannibalize him, too? I don't think so. Um, we're not entirely sure. I know that uh, the ritual activity included bleeding, using body parts to dedicate different buildings, but I don't think the Maya were eating each other. We do know that later Central Mexican cultures were actually doing acts of cannibalism. But you know, it doesn't say that outright in the text we read on the monuments or in the stairway. Um, we may be proven, we may, may be surprised much later to find out that might have happened. But uh, at this point, for what we know, not yet. So. so here we are just about to 800 AD, and we're going back into the Usuma Cinta River Valley at the site of Bonapak. Bonampak was a vassal state to the city of Yashchilan, who we saw earlier. And this is a very, very late monument in all of this. Uh, the murals you see here, this is a small detail from a mural in room three, this is a small detail in um, room one. These three small rooms in structure one of Bonampak are famous because these are those murals that changed the way we look at Maya culture. And what we see here are a group of women. And, you know, what we were saying before, Sir Eric Thompson didn't believe that women would even be portrayed in Maya art, let alone being ritually active. And the women here that you see, here's the queen, here's the king's mother, uh, other women here, there's the heir to, uh, this, this is the mom, her son would be the heir. This is her grandchild right here, who they believe might have been a thief, might have been a girl. And so here they are drawing ropes of thorns through their tongues for uh, blood auto sacrifice, and they're putting it in the basket right there. And what we're looking at here is a uh, time between 760, 776 and 790, where the site of Bonapak was growing in strength. Although a lot of the things that they did, they did on behalf of their larger neighbor upstream, Yashchilan. But uh, these, these elite families at Bonapak had a lot of social capital, a lot of cultural capital for having the resources to produce these beautiful murals. Now when we look at these, these buildings and monuments in the jungle, uh, we see the bare, bare infrastructure of them. They're just masonry blocks with some sculptures still adhering to them. What we do know from this kind of discovery is that these buildings were elaborately, they were plastered and carved in deep relief, not just in the stone, but also in the plaster. They were painted bright colors. Most often, if you were coming through the jungle, you might see a big white building or a big red building, and then all these beautiful colors painted in the details on the exterior. And then inside, these beautiful murals. Uh, we, we know that there's murals at Cacaxla in western Mexico. They're very Maya-like. Uh, there's a few scraps of murals at Calac Mule. Uh, there's probably, you could see some murals still left at Chichen Itza, which is very late. So uh, we know that there was a very active fresco painting uh, tradition in the Maya society. So uh, these women here are performing some very valuable social uh, cosmological rituals that would aid and support the king or the vassal king at Bonapá. At the beginning of the series, in room one, we see a very elaborate ritual including 
musicians and costume performers and lords from all over the valley. In the second room, it was this big battle, and people were being injured and killed and, and captured. And in room three, we see the um, ruling members of the family seated on uh, these stairs, these da on the dais, and people dancing and celebrating. What we, do, what we saw in the first room included the king, but by room three, the king's not there anymore. So what we assume happened, and we do know this from texts at Yash Chilon and some of the things we've read in texts at Unapak, is that in the late 780s, uh, Chan Muan II was still an active participant in all of this. We believe he was killed in battle sometime between 789 and 790. And by the time these murals were almost completed, um, he had already died. And we believe he is interred in some of the monumental uh, additions <coughs> to this structure. So and by the time you get to room three, here's the wife, here's mom, but no king. And his three sons are dancing in the courtyard, and the granddaughter is present in some of the pictures. By 800, a lot of uh, major myocytes had gone into decline, and we see a reflorescence of that activity pushed toward the north, toward Belize, toward the Yucatan Peninsula, and then a real fluorescence in the post-classic at sites like Uxmal, Chichen Itza, and other big myocytes up there. But by the time you get that far north and that late in time, the uh, power structure goes from a very focused, um, ruling, either an individual ruler or a king and a queen, to a much more distributed power structure among elite families. So when we see these sites at, uh, see the Temple of Kukukan and some of the other buildings at Chichen Itza or the Temple of the Magician at Ushmal. What we're seeing there is a lot more broadly distributed um, council type of hierarchy and rulership as opposed to something focused on the ruling family. So if you want to compare it to, say, Victorian um, England, you've got the, the Queen and then you've got Parliament, which is very similar to what we're seeing in um, the Maya region at that time. So, um, is there any questions you have of what you see or something you want me to, to go over again?